Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Profit Tool Belt podcast. Today, we're going to be doing a pretty cool interview with John Seaman. You think you're talking to an excavation contractor, but you're not really talking to an excavation contractor. He's got quite the story. And today, he and I are going to be talking about how he reinvented himself, not once, but multiple times in the construction trades. I know you're going to love it. Stay tuned. Mr. John Seaman, how are you? I'm good, sir. Are you? I am good. It's good to see you in here. What a great studio you've got there. I appreciate it, man. We've worked hard on getting this thing. It's a, still a work in progress, you know, but we haven't got it all refined yet, but but it'll get there. Yeah, it looks nice. You got that. For people who are just listening to this as an audio, there's a video as well. So John's yeah, got too. A, a nicer studio than me. That's what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> it's not nicer. It's different. Studio envy. <laughs> studio envy. Um, hey, John, it's great to have you with us. We're going to talk yeah, today man. about how you had to reinvent yourself because you've been in, well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to give away your story, but you've been in a couple <laughs> of different trades and a business owner in a couple of different trades. Yeah. You didn't, yeah. you're not today where you were before. That's right. We've moved a little bit down the road for sure. We started with nothing and we still got most, most of it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can see where this is going to go. Started with nothing and we still got most of it. Yeah, that's right. Somebody once told me, you know how to make a million dollars in the fitness industry? Start with two. You start with two. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Just lose all the way down. You know how I know that? How? I, I used to own a gym. Oh, yeah. Ouch. Yeah. Yeah. So I uh, know that lesson all too well. Yeah. See, this is all just about the business of business. You and I are talking to each other like a couple of trades contractors, but it turns out there's other stuff we've been busy with. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a businessman's a businessman, right? You know, you end up, end up getting your hands in all kinds of different things. Yeah. Hey, well, let's, let's get into things and, and learn a little bit more about you. Cause today we're going to talk about reinvention. You're a mm -hmm. master of reinventing yourself, but John Seaman, who the heck are you? And how is it you come to be speaking to all these forward facing business owner contractors all over the world? Yeah. I appreciate that, man. Uh, you know, essentially a businessman, you know, I, 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 done a lot of different businesses in the trades. Uh, so, you know, you can call me a tradesman, uh, real estate investor, developer, uh, but essentially all that's business, you know, mm. uh, and, and, and we still do all those things. Uh, but, um, yeah, I don't know if you want me to, you know, tell the whole story from start well, to finish, but I love the fact that so, you're, that's what we're, well, today we're going to talk about how you reinvented yourself. So yeah, we're going to pull that apart and I pull that apart. Nicely, yeah. but I, I I love the fact that you opened up your description with the fact that you're a businessman, not a trades guy. Yeah, yeah. How hard was it to start to define yourself as a business person, not an excavation contractor, or not a builder? Uh, uh yeah, that's a that's a great question, man. Because really, you know, at first, I never seen myself as a businessman, right? And I think that <clears throat> that's a lot harder for most tradesmen to do is. You know, they, uh, mm. the, the term businessman or the term entrepreneur is almost like, eh, you know, they don't. Yeah, yeah there's yeah. an ick factor, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but essentially, the minute that you decide, hey, I, I'm no longer working for anybody and I'm mm. going to go start my own gig uh, doing whatever the trade it is, you then become a businessman. You know, no, no way around it. You know, uh, whether that's a good one or a bad one, that's, that's a whole nother conversation. But yeah. the, the moment that you take that step, you're, you're a businessman and you're not going to want to admit it and you're not going to want to do the things that you have to do to be a businessman. That's right. Uh, but if you want money in your pocket money in your bank account, you want to be able to support your family, you're going to have to realize that you're no longer the tradesman. You are now a businessman and start acting accordingly and thinking accordingly and building your business accordingly. <clears throat> and, and and moving from there, you know, as, as a businessman. Yeah. I'm glad you got to that point. Cause, and you're absolutely right. I have to think like I'm that person. Imagine somebody who was, uh, who <clears throat> let's go back to fitness for a second. And you said, or I said to you, Hey, John, what do you do for workout? And you go, ah, you know, every couple of weeks I run 26 miles. <laughs> you're like, yeah. 26.2 miles. Yay, yeah. 26.2, yeah. 26.3, whatever it takes. Yeah. Uh, isn't that a marathon runner? Well, yeah, but I mean, I just like to run. Yeah. You know, in reality, yeah. you're a marathon runner. You think like a marathoner, you train like a marathoner, yeah. you eat like a marathoner, you wear the shorts that are perhaps a little too short. We should just let everybody know that. 
Yeah. You're sure. Right. Um, part of the lifestyle, right? Part, part of the lifestyle, right? <laughs> I'm making fun of poor Rick Patak. He's our resident foreman <laughs> trainer here. He's a marathoner. But it's the same thing. You have to define yourself as that. And then you start to hang out with people who are more like that. You start to mm-hmm. read the books and the magazines and listen to the podcast. It's all part of that understanding. But if you'd never cross that void in your mind, it's that mindset shift you haven't made and you get stuck. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it needs to be conscientious. You know, you need to, you need to at some point think, okay, this is who I now am. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and you can be a business man in the trades, you know, so you can still wear both hats, but you need to, it's very important. Uh, like you said, to get around the other folks who are now business folks and not just tradesmen, you know, yeah. uh, to learn those things and, and absorb all that and retain everything you need to retain to gain the knowledge and to grow the business and to get better and better and better. So you can get a little more time and a little more change in your pocket, you know? Yeah. Well, that's why people listen to this show, probably yours as well. You've got a podcast called grinding for greatness. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. We have some guests on here that we just talk about their success stories from, you know, a lot of different genres of life and uh, talk about the the ride from, you know, starting, you know, from ground zero and building up whatever it is that they're doing, you know, mm-hmm. businessmen, tradesmen, uh, artists, Musicians, athletes, doesn't matter, everything. Right? Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's go back in time. What was your first trade? When did you first strap on, I don't know, steel toes and a hard hat or put on the belt? What, like, what was your. Yeah. Uh, so it's funny. You know, I tell folks all the time that I grew up really poor and I had to start real young because I had a very expensive hobby, which was racing. Yeah. Racing. <laughs> yeah. What would you we race? Raced, we raced dirt bikes. Uh, so, uh, you know, it was me and my dad uh, going to the races every single weekend and, you know, all, all through the week we work to get the money to go race. So literally one of my earliest memories as a, as a child was carrying, I was the guy who went around and cleaned up the job site, you know, kept it clean and everything. Yeah. And, and, and I was carrying a five gallon bucket. And I remember the five gallon bucket being as tall as I was dragging it around the job site really? throwing all the scraps. In it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> I grew, I grew up, you know, low man on totem pole, you know, just learning around construction. You know, my yeah. dad was, my dad always worked for somebody and, uh, they, you know, built custom homes and spec homes and stuff. And so that's where I started, you know, I went off to college and everything and traveled for four years and came back here, uh, you know, to start my own business. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, years before that, before I went off to college, me and my dad would just do side gigs in the evenings and weekends. So we kind of built up a little bit of a, a, a customer base, you know, and a, a little rapport with some folks and, so I felt like it was easy when I, when I thought it was time for me to start my own business, to come mm. back here and, t- you know, plug back into those customers and, you know, had good word of mouth and good testimonials and stuff that I could build off of. And uh, so, yeah, construction was really where it all started. Custom homes. Custom homes. Yeah. And yeah. Um, are, are those people that bought custom homes from you coming back for another custom home or do you do renovations as well? Or is it just word yeah, of mouth so- to get another custom <clears throat> gig? Uh, so of course, when we, the first, you know, when we first started the business, it was just remodels and additions and roofs and sides and doors and windows and decks and everything that everyone does when they first Perfect. start, you know, yeah, yeah exactly. I can do any, yeah. I'm not afraid of anything. So I'll do that. <laughs> yeah, I'll do right. everything. Yeah. yeah I, you know, I've, I've stayed up all night watching YouTube videos to go do a job. I sold the oh, next morning. You know? <laughs> I'm just look, there. You, yeah. Oh yeah. There used to be a place where I live called Beaver Lumber. <clears throat> and they had this little rack at the front of the store that had all, all these pamphlets, how to fix a deck, how to yeah. repair window sash, how to <laughs> do the, how to power wash. And so I go get a gig and then I'd run to Beaver Lumber and get the yeah. flyer and go, what was do your, I got to do? That was your Bible, wasn't it? <laughs> no idea, man. No idea what I was doing. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you know, there's, you know, we, we, we built a client base basically, you know, with all those remodels and stuff like that. And then, you know, I went and got my general contractor's license and we do. Oh, some, you did? Yeah. 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 So okay. uh, after a year, you know, we were getting into that $30,000 gap, which in, you know, said North Carolina is you got to have a contractor's license if you're going to do a job over 30,000 bucks. So yeah, I decided to go get that. And then obviously that opened the door to be able to do, you know, custom homes. And we sold a couple of those and uh, yeah, you know, some of those customers came back or had, uh, uh, you know, we, we'd travel to other locations for those customers that had beach property and we'd get on there and build them a custom home, you know? Uh, so 
that kept growing and growing and growing. And, um, you know, we've, we've went into different areas since then, since we built that business and kept growing it and, uh, got a little bit of our time back and kind of looked around and was like, well, what else do we want to do now? You know? Yeah. Bobby, you guys are called JC property professionals, but from yeah. what I understand your main is your, let me ask instead of telling yeah. is your yeah. main business custom homes or it, excavation? Yes. So it's a long story, but, um, the main, well, that's what we're is, here for John. That's right. I hope you get buckled up and get ready to yeah, get yeah, fastened yeah. in for this one. But, uh, the, the main business was custom homes. Um, and then, you know, we decided to start some other businesses in conjunction with that kind of to wash each other's hands. Uh, so okay. as we started getting some track home building, we needed some other subcontractors and stuff. And we, uh, you know, we started a tree business that, you know, come in and clear the lots and stuff like that, and then could provide a service for the homes after they were done. Yeah. Uh, and then we started a grading and demolition business so that if someone, you know, bought a section of land and needed it prepared to build, uh, instead of me hiring that portion out, we were, which we were struggling with to find, you mm-hmm. know, good trusted local contractors that were Johnny on the spot when we needed them. Uh, we, we started that business and kept ramping it up. And of course, you know, we didn't do it just for ourselves. We were doing it for other contractors and it's, it's took off like wildfire, you know? Uh, so it's extremely busy now. And last couple of years, I kind of scaled the custom home building back and I've utilized a lot of those resources to start doing my own development. Mm. Uh, so kind of eliminating the customer out of that process, which allows me to move a little bit faster and, uh, with, you know, the, the delay and, products and materials i can make decisions on the spot versus yeah. waiting you know for a customer to make a decision on that and you know you there's a little bit better profit in the end too yeah so you're you're making spec homes now <clears throat> yeah yeah specs and uh uh flips um we do some multifamily stuff where you just got another trailer park sector and you mm-hmm. buying parks and fixing them up you know that are profit ad and being able to sell those for a higher profit or retain them for some passive income, you know, so, uh, yeah. mobile home parks the, are a nice land bank because usually they're zoned multifamily already. Yeah. And if you know, you're just going to sit on it, get the cash flow. one day, yep. somebody says, you know, this would make a great place for townhouses. And you go, well, yeah. it turns yeah. out I own all of that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And a lot of those areas, uh, you know, needs, taller multifamily, you know, uh, more multifamily in, a, in, a, in on the same footprint, uh, mm-hmm. is what that means. Density, um, yeah. yeah, exactly. So, you know, that will come up over time, you know, so if you can hold it and retain it and just enjoy the passive income until that happens, enjoy the passive income and the drama of mobile home park management. You, you, hi, you hire a property manager so that you do not have it, to deal with I that drama because it is a movie for sure. <laughs> Isn't it crazy? <laughs> there is a show. I think it's called uh, Trailer Park Boys. That, uh, yeah. Oh yeah. And, and you know, that show is of course a little bit exaggerated, but, uh, but not gosh, a lot. If, you, if you've ever owned a trailer park, you know what we, what we mean by that. Yeah. It's a, uh, it, it's, it's, it's constant entertainment to say the least. Yeah. But this is where your, your mindset of being a, um, uh, a business owner really comes in because you're not constrained by saying you're a custom home builder or you're an excavator or you're a property development guy, or you're a property manager, you're a businessman. You just happen to do all these different things. That's exactly right. You know, and, and, you know, going back to the beginning of this conversation in in the beginning, I would have never thought that way. You know, I I would have thought, Hey, I'm the best at whatever the skill is that I'm doing. I'm the best construction guy. There's no one here that's going to build you a better custom home. That's, that was my mindset, you know? And of course I, you know, I I always want to over deliver and exceed expectations on whatever I'm doing, you know, but then my mind definitely started to pivot and shift and change. And that was really because my pockets were empty. And when you have a financial burden, you can really start to think very differently. You know, I I couldn't agree more. Actually, let me ask you this just back and forth. Do you think money solves problems or cleverness solves problems? So to that point, I could have kept, yeah, I was making great money. I was bringing in great money, if that makes sense. So my gross was really, really good on these houses that I was doing, Yeah, but because I was not very intelligent that money was going from one pocket to the other right out the door. So I had to think differently and I had to, you know, strategize a little bit differently. So the, that my answer to that would be, it doesn't matter how much money I had coming in in my left pocket. If it was all going out the right pocket and I wasn't being smart, 
Yeah. It doesn't, you, know, you can never outrun that problem, you know? So you have to definitely think differently and definitely be a lot more clever than just, Hey, how, how much money can I bring in? You know? Yeah. People tend to think that I just want to throw money at a problem. Yeah. And it's money's not going to solve problems. It's being clever. It's being smart. It's thinking, you know, I, I call it working from the neck up. Yeah. That's what we get paid to do as business owners. We get paid to think we get, and then we get paid to plan and act or, you know, do. Yeah. Uh, but it's not but, money that's going to solve your problems. It's thinking it through and taking action. Money, money will solve the symptom for a while. No, oh, nice. the problem's always going to be there. And the cool thing about thinking with your, with your, from your shoulders up is you get, you get to save your back. You know, <laughs> you, nice. know you don't have to work with your back anymore. You get to just work with everything between your ears, you know? Yeah. <laughs> hey, how was that? How did that shift happen to you? Because you started as a customer. Well, you started dragging around a five gallon bucket that was taller than you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But, but was there, yeah, and a that's, conscious- a, that's a true story too, by the way. Yeah. Listen, I've <laughs> just, just, just to trade stories. I remember I was a kid and I was getting ready for, it was Saturday. I was getting ready to go play soccer. Mm-hmm. And my dad comes into my room and he goes, you're not playing soccer today. And I was the captain of the team. He goes, you're painting a house, get changed. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, and what that, are you going to do? There's not yeah. a lot of room for negotiation and talking right. to an Italian father. And so yeah. he, drove yeah. me to my, he drove me to my <laughs> uncle's rental property and I painted. Mm-hmm. And I just, I can never overcome the smell of stale booze underneath stairs. It's, oh yeah. You know, like beer bottles that get stored underneath yeah. stairs yeah. and just that yeah. smell. Um, yeah. But yeah, that was, that was my introduction to any trades. For You're sure. not playing soccer today. You're painting yeah. a house. I'm like, <laughs> what's painting a house mean? I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. I didn't know I was a kid, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's what you do. <clears throat> That's right. That's right. Doesn't matter how you get thrown into it, right? I mean, it's what you're going to take away from it. Where was that? Did you have a conscious, you know, I'm 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 imagining this mm-hmm. drizzly Saturday morning. You walk outside to get in your truck and the heavens open up and the light shines down and it says, John, you must change what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And you realized because of some huge pain that you had to change to this businessman mentality. It's probably mm-hmm. not that cool. What happened to make you go it, from being a trades guy to a business guy? It's not that cool. Uh, actually, what happened is um, I hired a coach uh, who, you know, again, you know, going back, I had the mindset of I'm going to be the best custom home builder mm-hmm. and then I can continue to raise my profits or raise my prices. And that's going to give me more profit. And that's how I grow and scale and build a business, which is not how you do it, by the way, for anyone that's listening that doesn't know. So I hired a coach because I thought there, I know there's something wrong here because yeah. I'm bringing in all this money, but I'm broke every day. So I hired a coach and, you know, he was like, what are you doing? Who are you? What's the books look like? You know, and I just yeah. opened everything up to him, you know, because I knew he knew more than me. Right. And he said, look, not everyone is, is made to be a businessman. You know, some, some people just need to continue working a job and, I thought this, this son of a gun, I'm paying this guy to tell me this, you know, and I kind of had to step back and, and think and put my ego in check, you know, and, you know, I thought, man, he's right, but I know I can be a businessman. I could know? be that guy. Yeah. <laughs> Not very competitive. This comes from your uh, dirt bike racing. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought, you know, he, he's right. I don't, I don't guess everybody is, is, is cut out for this, you know? But I knew at that point I couldn't go backwards and go get a job somewhere else. So I thought, okay, let me put my ego to the side Mm. and let me think about this. What do I need to do to change who I am to become a businessman and be able to fix this business? So there's no cool story about it. As a matter of fact, I hate to tell that story because it was, it was very eye opening, but it was like the first moment of the ego check. Right. Mm. And, and after that, you know, I almost felt like he was being dismissive of coaching me, you know? So we had another conversation and I was like, look, you know, you kind of irritated me there when you said that, you know, but uh, after thinking about it for a couple of days, I think you're right. You know, so I want to continue to pay you to be my coach and I'm willing to show you that I can make the change, you know? And uh, so we worked together for about a year and he kind of got me on the right track and, um, I think I kind of outgrew his, his coaching and mentorship. And then I went and reached out to somebody else that, you know, was a little bit higher up, a little bit different level of coaching and uh, yeah. kept learning from them. And here we are. Yeah. So you've been on a constant path of learning. It's not, there's no epiphany. 
And, no, I'm, and I'm glad you yeah. said it. There was no heavens opening up on a cold and yeah. rainy North Carolina day. It's this gradual, constant forward movement of evolution, right? Yeah. And, you know, it, it, it you know, when you, when someone like myself is telling this story of like, yeah, I started here and now I'm here, it seems like, oh, well, there must just been one pivot and uh, just moved right along the track. Well, that's definitely not how it is. There's a, there's a ton of those pivots, you know, there's a ton of, of reality checks that you have throughout the way yeah. that you can, you can either, again, have to set your ego aside and learn from and to get to that next plateau, knowing <clears throat> there's going to be another point of a plateau and I'm yes. going to have to learn again. Yeah. Uh, and, and dude, it's not easy to do, but if you want to continue to grow, then that's what you're going to have to do. And it's, it's a constant growth path of the cool yeah. thing though, is you just repeat that, that system over and over and over and just repeat that system of setting your ego aside. You know, one of the things I, I have to remind, remind myself of this as well, but it's, it's true for all of us. I have to have enough ego yeah. to put it aside. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So I've got to get beyond, you know, cause some people we're proud, right? We've, we're oh, creators, yeah. we're builders. We've already hired a crew of five or six guys. I can do anything. Mm-hmm. I'm doing it, but mm-hmm. I'm stuck. And so mm-hmm. you've got the ego or the confidence of saying, mm-hmm. I could, I've already built something out of nothing. Why am I stuck here? But you got to get to the next level of ego that says, okay, what don't I know? Yeah. Yeah. What's my yes. blind spot? One of my, one of my current coaches, uh, one of the very first things he says, when you come into coaching with him is, you know, you've, you've gotten to this point because of four, you know, in, in the whole realm of knowing everything business-wise, you know, 4%. And then, and then you, you, you know, you know that there's some things that you don't know. Mm. And that's, that's about 2%. And there's still a whole another 94% of stuff that you don't even know. You don't know. Yeah. You know, there, there's someone out there that knows that stuff. Yeah. Uh, it, we just got to find them and get, you know, next to them and learn from them, you know? Yeah. That's, that's the conscious competence scale. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Right. That's Where right. you move from being consciously, unconsciously incompetent to consciously competent. But to your point, you just keep going through this learning. Yeah. We hope not everybody does it. And that, and again, yeah. it's okay. Not everybody has to build, you know, mm-hmm. the kind of company you've got or the kind of company that I've got. You just, mm-hmm. what you want, mm-hmm. what, do, what do you want? But once you've clearly defined what you want, it's easy to get there because you can see the yeah. path. The hard yeah. part's really in the definition. That's right. Um, yeah. It, it, like I said, it's 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 very simple because you just get to repeat those processes. It's definitely not easy, uh, but the the path the path is simple to get there. You know. Does yeah. that make sense? It, it well, it makes sense to me because I'm in it all the time. Yeah. But you know, we're talking to a lot of people here who've never done. Mm-hmm. You know, listening mm-hmm. to this show or listening to your show might be the only times they've the only time they've um invested in themselves Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know looked inward instead of outward and and that's instead of buying tools they've bought a book or listened to the podcast right yeah and dude that's so huge because um when i hired that very first coach you know uh I had never read a book of self-development. I've never read a book about business. Mm. I, I did do research, constant research. Like I said, that, you know, talking about watching YouTube videos the night before I went to do something, I did a lot of research on how to do the trade, but I never did any research or any development on how to grow a business or be a different person and have a different mindset. So getting in that community with mm. that coaching that's all everybody talked about was books, 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 books. And, you know, I, I'm not even thinking about books, you know? So I just started, you know, taking read. all the books and I could, yeah. I, 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 my goal was to read a book a week and I, I thought, well, I can read 52 books a year if I do that, you know? And, uh, the, the huge takeaway from that was I had, at that point I had invested hundreds of thousands of dollars into my business. You know, I, right. I was, I was starting, more businesses and I was buying trucks and chippers and excavators and trailers and all kinds of stuff, you know, but never spent a dollar on myself, which was ultimately would never help me grow myself or the business. So I think my point is anyone who's listening to this, who has, who is at that point, who is investing in all these cool tools. Cause there's a, cause as tradesmen, we freaking love tools. tools, Right. (laughs) 
his, these guys, these guys, you know, my, my pops is the same way, man. He's got every, every DeWalt or Milwaukee tool you can Everything, ever think right? of created, yeah. you know, I'm like, Hey, you know, why don't you come to this? Uh, why don't you come to this seminar with me? Hey, oh, I no, want a fat know. max record bar, like nobody's yeah. business, but I oh, know yeah. I, don't, I don't need it, but the thing yeah. looks fantastic. They're I'm sweet. Pretty, sure. I just need it in the yeah. garage. Just yeah. look at it. Uh, <laughs> but it, you know, you, you have to have the tools to go produce the work and it, that's cool because it makes life a lot easier and everything. But if you ever want to get away from that work mm -hmm. and make life a little bit easier, you need to take the time and money and energy and invest it in yourself. You know, you're only as strong as the six inches between your ears. And if, if it's not strong and tough uh -oh. and built and developed, then it doesn't matter how great your business is because we're always going to have so many obstacles and hurdles and everything to get over in business, especially in the trades, man. Cause I've, I've like I said, I've got other businesses in, in different areas and trades are always unique in the hurdles we have to get over. But if you're not mentally tough between the ears, dude, just, that's going to be a very hard thing to get over, you know? So, well, imagine, imagine that you put uh, a guy in charge of a vehicle and he had all control over that vehicle for the year. And at the end of the year, he comes to you and goes, yeah, the thing's broken down. Yeah. And you go, well, let's figure out why it's broken down. And you realize mm -hmm. he'd never topped it up with oil, mm -hmm. never topped it off with any of the fluids, never, mm -hmm. you know, lubed the joints. You'd be like, well, why didn't you take care of the vehicle? <laughs> right. It's the same thing with our mind. These businesses are running just on the strength and conviction of the business owner. And if the business owner is not feeding it the right fuel, which is good information, you know, listening to this show or your show, getting the right information in, working on themselves, you know, as we say, sharpening the ax. Yeah. Eventually it's going to give out or you're going to just reach some, some fake now, level of max that you didn't yeah. have to stop at. You could have gone further. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, and that's, that's that plateau, you know, you, and, and you'll continue to hit those plateaus, you know, but until you, take those times to reset and learn a little bit differently Then you can't get through those, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You used to, you had a gym of your own. I did. Yeah. What, what kind of gym was it? Yeah. It was just a 24 hour gym. You know, it was, we called it battleground strength and fitness. It was for, you know, meatheads, you know, it was all steel plate loaded equipment. Uh, okay. it, really, really cool. You know, dark, dark atmosphere, loud music, you know, Concrete. Uh, it was the kind of gym I wanted, you know, I mean? yeah. of course. Of course. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, yeah, I mess around a little bit with Olympic lifting, mm -hmm. right? So you think of back squats, but you think about cleans and snatches, overhead snatches and stuff like that. Yeah. That is, um, <clears throat> and so for anybody listening, that's the stuff you'd see on the Olympics when these ridiculous guys put a ridiculous weight above their head. Yeah. But that's a business owner through their own strength. They've taken this ridiculous bar and weights that's on the floor and they've somehow managed to get it up over their head. They've now built a business and they're standing there holding it and they're teetering. Mm -hmm. And what I think what you and I are talking about is just saying to them or reminding them, you know, you can build a rack for that. Yeah. Yeah. Rack that thing and take rack a break that for thing. a second. Yeah. And then <laughs> take a step back, rest your arms, yeah. rest your legs, rest your back. Yeah. I go, huh. I got a business here. I'm a businessman. Yeah. Right. And then as soon as you look at it on the rack, if you're a businessman, you're like, you know, I'll bet you if I build a stronger rack, I oh, yeah. wait on that. For baby. sure. Yeah. <laughs> then the, then the wheels start turning and you get to be creative and strategize a little bit different. And, it, and then it really becomes fun, you know, but it's survival when you're holding it by yourself over your head. Yeah. Try not to it, buckle. Right. At some, at some point, the muscles are going to be fatigued, man. You can't hold it there no more. You know, yeah. you're going to have, you have to realize and get to a level of, Hey, let me put this thing on the rack, you know? Yeah. Hey, what were some of your favorite books? Cause I'm sure people are curious. What books did you read that really turned it around for you or helped and, you turn it around? Yeah. I've, I've, I've read so many books now because I, you know, I didn't stop at the first year and then, and, and I'm not talking about sitting down and reading a paper book. I'm talking about listening to audio because I'm spend most of my day in my truck running from job to job or pricing jobs, you go into vendors or whatever. So turn your car into a university, turn your truck into a university, right? It's the cheapest education you'll ever buy. Yeah. Um, a ton though, man, I, I, you know, one of my current coaches is Grant Cardone, uh, in, in his team with Brendan Dawson and them, I've read mm -hmm. every single book he's ever wrote. Uh, and, and actually one of the very first books, uh, in that first year was the 10 X rule, which he, mm -hmm. which he wrote. 
um, which really just talks a lot about the hustle. If you've never, if you've never read it or any of the listeners have never read it, it talks about what it actually takes to grow and scale a business and the, the amount of energy that it takes, uh, which we can talk about for an hour. You well, know, it goes but, back uh, to that weightlifting example. It takes yeah. a lot to get that over your head. I think, um, one book that is extremely important for all people that are ready to kind of make that shift is anything that Jocko Willink has, has wrote uh, extreme really? ownership. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Extreme ownership and the dichotomy of leadership are two of his books. Uh, extreme ownership, of course, just talks about, you know, owning uh, where you're at, where you want to be, what everything that happens mm. to you is because of what you're doing, you know? And then the dichotomy of leadership is, of course, when you after you make that pivotal change and how to uh, how to lead by example and stuff. He's an ex Navy SEAL. Um, he's in, he's intense, very intense. I, 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 his he uses a lot of Navy SEAL analogies and and stories uh, and relates yeah. them to business. So I really really like that. Uh, but if you're at the point. Uh, where, you know, you're, you're standing there under that rack and, 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 you know, Hey, there's something, I have to do something with this weight. <clears throat> the number one book you need to go read is the E-Myth by Michael Gerber. Uh, Isn't it great? It's, it's Stands amazing. the test of time. Yeah. It does. And, and there's a ton of, uh, you know, if you're not in the trades and you're listening to this, there's a ton of revisions to that book yeah. of in, in diff, for different industries, you know, so just type in the E-Myth and whatever you do, it'll come up, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, man, it's, it's amazing. And, and anyone that's at that point definitely needs to listen to it. <clears throat> yeah. We've talked about, or I talk about that book a lot. It was one of the turning points for me when I started this, um, at, at the time of our recording, it's December 30th as in two yeah. days, I'll have been a business coach for 23 years. And wow. one of the first books I read was the E-Myth by Michael, the E-Myth revisited by Michael Gerber. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. uh, that's where he talks about the tension in our mind as a business owner, the technician who's doing the work, the manager who's trying to you know, measure everything that we've done, and the entrepreneur, mm-hmm. that visionary, that business person who's looking forward. And the challenge of being a business owner is you're wearing all three hats. You're seeing the world in three ways. And it's hard to pull yourself away from one viewpoint into the other. What's easier is to start understanding when you're in one of those viewpoints and understand why you're doing things. Yeah, exactly. And even today, everything I talk about, I can talk about it in, in, in any kind of way, but essentially I'm just rewording what Michael Gerber says in his book. You know, I mean, that's, that, that's what growing and scaling and starting a business is everything he talks about in the book. You have to, you, if anyone ever came to me and said, what's the first thing that I should do when I'm ready to start a business, I'd say, don't start, read this book. <laughs> and then yeah. go start your business, you know? Yeah. Well, Hey, listen, a lot of people get caught in something called analysis paralysis. Where uh, they yeah. just read books yeah. or take courses, but never actually do something. Yeah. Uh, let, actually, let me ask this as a question. How important do you think it is to fail and keep trying? Like, are, did you score every time you tried? No. And, I, and today I, I constantly fail, you know, and, and it's great to be able to hire a coach and learn from the failures and mistakes that they've made, but you're never going to learn a better lesson than failing and, and making mistakes yourself. Yeah. Uh, and, and that kind of goes back to the energy I was talking about it, that it takes to continue to run a business because you're going to fail. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to take s- several steps backwards at some times. And uh, man, when you get hit in the chin like that, sometimes it's hard to put your nose back down and keep fighting, you know, but uh, those are the best lessons that you're always going to learn. Yeah. I have found that uh, the the failures actually teach me more than the wins. You don't you don't learn a whole lot from a win, right? Because yeah. a, a lot of times you don't sit back and think about the win. You know, you might think of, you might think about the mistakes you made to get to that win, uh, but you you take a pretty good hit to the chin, and you're going to reflect a whole lot on that. And you're not going to make that mistake a second time. Usually, I've, I've reflected a lot then. <laughs> yeah, me too. I've me had too. the opportunity, but you know what? It, it's uh, there's something I used to say to my uh, uh, some of the people on my team and the leadership of my team. I said the best surfers ride the biggest waves, mm-hmm. right? Yep. So if you're if you want to be a leader, you've got to go and tackle that big wave. Yes, yep. small people tackle small waves, but the best surfers they go and surf the big waves. They mm-hmm. take the challenges and they fall a couple times. But mm-hmm. when they, when they nail it, it's beautiful. It's sweet. And so if you want to be a leader, if you want to do big things, you've got to go do big things and you've got to fail big and you'll win big. 
going back to my racing career, I, um, you know, a lot of folks will invest 10 years before they get to like a pro level, you know? Yeah. And, um, I went from C class to pro in four years. And that's because every year I would move up a class more than I should have. And I, and I'll go and I'll, oh. I'll get my butt, I'll get my butt kicked for the first half of that year. But then the second half of the year, I've, I've caught up to those boys pace, you know? Yeah. So I was able to move along a lot faster, but I was taking a huge risk in the beginning. You were challenging you know? yourself by going into a, a higher <clears throat> level group. I always tell people it's really easy to be the rock star in a small group or in a group that you're comfortable with, but you go get out of that group and get, get, get around folks that are doing a little bit more and you're not the rock star anymore and you're extremely uncomfortable. The cool thing is soon you're going to become a rock star in that it, group. It pulls yeah. you up there. Yeah. 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 I can, I can never remember who says this, but you, you know, you, you and I are more like the five people we hang out with. Yeah. You're the sum of your five friends, some yeah. of your five friends. And I, I, so I need to be very careful about those influences in my life. I'm not oh, yeah. taking away from friends and family and, you know, those things that you're just born with. That's your, your built in team. <laughs> but, I, but I have to be very conscious about who I hang out with and who I choose to associate with, because yeah. if they just want to complain over beers at the pub every night, Mm-hmm. You know, maybe, maybe that's fun for you. Maybe it's not, but you're probably not going to move forward with that kind of crowd. Yeah. Who are you getting your information from? You know, it's like we were talking about earlier, you know, when you get to that plateau, if you're hanging out with the folks that are in that same plateau, you're not going to be able to get to the next one. You need to, at that point, start hanging out with some folks that are in the next level above you that can help bring you up through that, whether it's, you know, finding those folks and getting around them locally or paying a coach to that's, you know, yeah. there that, you you know, where you want to be, you know? Or we've got modern technology here now. Yeah. You know, Listen think, to a think, podcast. think back in time. Who could have hung out? <laughs> you know, we're we're one measurement of that path. There's people that are, I'm glad you said you've worked your way through a number of coaches because, and I've done the same. And I'm a coach mm-hmm. and I still say the same thing. Mm-hmm. You're going to mm-hmm. outgrow a coach and you're going to move to yeah. the next one, right? It's not yeah. one and done forever. But um, <clears throat> listening to podcasts or l- watching those YouTube videos is a great way to yeah. do it, especially if you live in a small town where you can't just drive to the Atlanta Convention Center or the Ottawa convention center and go see a speaker or join a networking mm-hmm. event. Mm-hmm. You've got to find other ways. And, and these shows are a great way to do that. You couldn't have done this years ago. Yeah. There's so many, there's so many outlets nowadays, man, the audio books, paperback books, still these podcasts, YouTube videos, you know, there's, there's zoom meetings that you can get on instead of going and sitting in the seminar, you know, you can, yeah. you can, you can join whatever seminar nowadays, almost from the, your, your bathtub, if you want to, you know, from your uh, bathtub, you said, yeah, I've, I've been on, I've been on zoom calls and seen people in their tub, you know, like, these people don't care anymore. Right. But you know, whatever, man, at least they're getting the information. As long know? as they don't drop the laptop in there. That's what happened right. to Freddie? Yeah. Uh, Freddie's, uh, Freddie's gone. Yeah. Freddy's gone. Yeah. So, um, Tell us a little bit about your podcast as we start to wind down. I'm going to, I want people to know where to find you, but what's the grinding for greatness? How did that come to be? And what do you guys talk about there? Yeah, man. So, you know, my entire life, I've always thought about, you know, the grind, the hustle, how hard you have to work to get to different levels. And and, and that's in everything I've done, you know, from mm-hmm. racing to build businesses to the gym. And uh, so that's kind of just been my philosophy is grinding for greatness. You know, that's what I've always told my buddies around me, you know, and it's, we've put it on shirts and it was our race team and stuff like that. Oh, okay. you know? Yeah. So, uh, you know, our, I had already kind of built that brand, not, not necessarily knowing what I was ever going to do with it. It was just a, a slogan we said, you yeah. know, uh, and when I decided to start the podcast, that's what I wanted to talk about was the grind on, uh, you know, anyone who's, who's reached any level of success on what it actually takes, how much energy it takes, the hustle it takes and, and more so the mindset that it takes, because when you're getting to that certain level of success, breaking through those plateaus, Mm. it takes a lot of energy and a lot of grit and a lot of grind and a lot of hustle. And I want to, I want folks to come into the podcast and talk about those stories and share some of the obstacles that they had to overcome so that my listeners who want to take that journey themselves, maybe are, are, are on the journey then can realize, Hey, you know, this isn't a superhero. They, they went through all the same things that I'm going through. You know, this is reality, you know? So we're just 
bringing in people from you know all walks of life to be able to talk about those stories to share with the listeners that can maybe learn a little bit from their experience is just going back to the failures we were talking about earlier. Yeah. They suck. It really sucks to, to fail and have to get, put your ego in check and learn from it. Listen to some of these guys' stories and let's learn from them, you know, and see what it's going to take to get through those obstacles. Yeah. So <clears throat> that's what we're talking about there for grinding for greatness. I love it. It's, it's great that you're doing that too. And again, how would you have, have how would you ever have been able to do that even 10 years ago? It just wouldn't be yeah. available. You might pick up something at a conference or see a cool TV show for a few minutes, but you wouldn't have a consistent channel delivering that to you. Right. And so yeah. I have to yeah. I have to really think about the information I'm putting in my head because that's mm-hmm. I'm gonna be a product of whatever I think about and do. And so I want to create myself to be the right kind of person, right? Along with my values and my goals. Yeah. One of our, so what, what we do on ground for greatness too, is we'll have a guest on, we'll let them talk about their story and kind of chop it up. And it's all just a very conversational listen. Uh, but then my, uh, marketing director and myself, James Hughes, will sit down and we'll kind of break down that story. And we'll talk about some of the internal monologues that you're going to have, uh, while you're on your story, while you're mm-hmm. on your, your, your way, uh, to success. And we can kind of break down when there were some of those hurdles that came up, uh, what you you need to tell yourself in your mind, because going back to what you just said, you know, you're getting this information coming in all around you, but your internal monologue never, ever, ever stops. So you need to be really, really, you know, conscious about what you're saying in your head throughout the day. Yeah. Uh, Cause it's, it can be extremely great for you. Or it can be extremely detrimental, you know? So can I share with you something that, you know, please I, do. I, yes, I hope sir. this, I hope this one is what I get quoted for the rest of my you know, <laughs> two generations after I'm gone. We're ready. Um, we got this. We got the sauna phone ready to go. Get right? ahead. Okay. <laughs> but, but I really believe this. It goes exactly what you're saying is what I say to myself when no one else is listening is what the world sees when everybody's watching. Yeah, that's so true, man. That's my internal, so my internal voice is it. If I say, yeah. you know, if you've got a kid and and uh, your kid says, "Dad, I'm really bad at soccer," well, they go on the field and guess what? They suck at soccer. <laughs> right? Yeah, but if they yeah. just change it a bit and say, "You know what, Dad? I'm getting better every day. I'm just getting a little bit better every day at soccer." That's just mm-hmm. a tiny change. They mm-hmm. can still suck. <laughs> yeah. Bad is bad. But, <laughs> but, but the mindset is they're getting a bit better. It's just a different way of saying it. And your mind, yeah. my mind is programmed to listen to that. Uh, if, if any of the listeners of yourself have ever been to a Tony Robbins seminar, which I would encourage any, everyone to go to, no matter yeah. what point you're at in your life, uh, it's, it's an amazing experience. And, and I don't know that Tony's going to do it a whole, month, whole lot longer because he's losing his voice. But uh, one of the very first things he says at, at, at all of his uh, seminars, and he's really great about not just saying something and putting a story with it that just sticks with you forever. Uh, but to cut it short, he'll, you know, he just says, uh, you get what you focus on. And he tells a story about crashing into a wall, you know, and, uh, but that doesn't have to be what your, what your eyeballs are focused on. That's what you're saying to yourself. That's mm-hmm. what you're thinking, which, what, what you're consciously thinking about, you know, and it, like I said, that could be really, really good. Or it could be really, really bad. So you gotta be very careful with what you're saying, uh, to yourself throughout the day, all day long. And that shows up differently in people, you know, you go back to your quote, you know, what you're saying inside may show up differently. You know, you, you, you may be insecure about things, but it show up as cockiness, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, so don't ever assume that what people's internal monologue is what's showing up on the surface uh, and, and be a little more conscientious about what you're thinking about, because that may show up differently than what you're hoping it does. Yeah. I'm no psychiatrist. No, so. that was really good. Dr. Phil. <laughs> was, I'm no psychiatrist. Was, so I don't know how to break all that down and how to fix that. But I do know that there is, there's a thing there. There's a problem there and you need to be aware of it. You know? Yeah, we all do. Yeah. Um, how do we find you? If somebody wants to get in touch with you or, I mean, we know your podcast is called grinding for greatness, but what are the other ways we can find you in the big wide world? I um, mean, everyone can find me everywhere on all social media. Just that uh, official John Seaman, J O H N S E A M A N is how you spell my name. Or you can just go to my website. It's J Seaman, S E A M A N, and then 111.com, John Seaman 111.com. And all my social media handles and everything are on there. You can send me a message on there, but I'm easy to find. There's not a whole lot of John Seamans in the world. 
No, well, it's, <laughs> it's you and you're the only one with the grinding for greatness podcast. That's perfect. Uh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I was on your show as well. So if people want to hear this twice, yeah. And from a different and, perspective. No, it's it, it. Yours was great, man. It's actually one of our most downloaded podcasts so far. So wow. uh, yeah, huge success, man. We've had a lot of really good feedback on it. Thank it's, you. it's, it's everywhere that you can listen to podcasts. Uh, so anyone that wants to listen to it, you gave a lot or a lot of really good insight. So uh, I would, I would encourage the listeners to take a second. I think it's 45 minutes is what we cut it down to and uh, jam packed of great information for sure. Thank you. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, we, we appreciate it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I think we'd ha- we're going to have to have you back again when you go through the next phase of re- your reinvention. So I'll, when I say goodbye, I'll just say goodbye for now. So we'll have you back. Yeah, absolutely, man. I hope so. All right. Thanks, John. Yes, sir. Bye-bye. Well, 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 thank you, Mr. John Seaman. I appreciate you coming on the show and sharing your information with us. Really a great interview where we talked a lot about mindset about the headspace between our ears. And folks, I hope the takeaway you got was one where it it reinforced that you're on the right path. If you're listening to my show, if you're listening to John's Grinding for Greatness, you're on the right path. If you're in the cabinetry trade or architectural millwork, you know, I've got another show called Cabinet Maker Profit System. If you're listening to those shows, you're already hanging out with the kind of people who are moving forward in their lives. And you're getting those influences and starting to see the world in a slightly different way. You're learning and putting in place the language of success. Keep doing that. Keep doing that. That will lead you forward. And don't forget, other people are watching you. Your kids, your family, your employees are watching you take these steps forward. Not winning every time. Both John and I talked a little bit about you know how failure was just a part of growing and going forward. The failures are going to come, but it's what you do about them that changes you and that makes you better every single time. John, thanks again for being on the show. Folks, if you want to hear him, Uh, go to Grinding for Greatness podcast. I'm going to make sure I've got those most recent episodes downloaded so I can listen myself when I'm in the truck. Stay tuned. We've got uh, questions and answers with Dom coming up next. Hi, today's question comes to us via an email uh, sent by uh, M. South. I'm going to use his last name, but not his first name, M. South. Hey, Dom, I need a little bit of advice. This is my first year owning my company, and I'm seeing a really steep drop-off in incoming leads and jobs. Where can I find jobs, especially for wintertime work, besides word-of-mouth referrals and Angie's List leads? Thanks in advance. Okay, Mr. South, uh, or M. South, thank you very much for your question. I'll answer it here. Well, hey, Mr. South, thank you very much for your question. Advice on uh, for a new business owner, and really any business owner. Uh, he's seen a drop off in leads. You know, things are tailing off, and he's worried. There's no more business coming in. If you're in that situation, hang on to your hats. I love marketing questions. They are fantastic. You know why? Because it's so easy to turn marketing around. And the reason for that is your competition. Yeah, it's amazing to think that, right? Uh, the reason marketing is easy when you start thinking about your competition is because your competition sucks at marketing. So the bar is set very low. It just is. It just is. Because that makes it easy. Even if you're bad at marketing, you're going to be better than the guys that don't market at all. See what I mean? Like you're trying at least. So here's how to put things in place successfully as a contractor for the win. I've got the answer for you, Mr. South, broken down into five parts, five steps. Uh, And the final step is broken into two subsections where we're going to break it down for residential answers and commercial answers. And then I've got an inspiring finish with something my mom said to me when I was a kid. How is that? Here's the answer. So um, I need to pick up my leads is basically, you know, and beyond word of mouth referrals and Angie's list. By the way, the the joke that business coaches tell when business coaches are out having an old fashioned or something like that is, uh, do you know what you call it when a client is relying on word of mouth and referrals for their business? That's called hope and a prayer marketing. And the reason for that is because you can't, you can't do anything. I mean, it's important to have word of mouth and referrals. I'm not taking away from that in the least. What I am saying though, is I can't make more referrals happen. I can't make more word of mouth happen. Sure. If we come through Thanksgiving or Christmas or a a Labor Day long weekend, more people are talking, but what am I just hoping they're talking about me? Hoping that one of their neighbors says to the other guy, Hey, uh, really would like to put a pool in my backyard or gee, I need a new kitchen cabinets. Like you're just hoping. 
you're not actually directing traffic towards you. So we need much more proactive ways of doing things. And that's what I'm going to talk about here. The very first thing I want you to know is, and write this down, number one, target is everything. Who you're going to go after is everything. See, I want you to be intentional about who you go after. This is part of the simple system we talk about in coaching. Understand your perfect customer, really know them really, really well. There's a saying, you know, and I got to keep saying this. I stole this line from somebody else. And I can't find the quote anywhere, but it certainly isn't mine. So I'm not going to take the credit for it. But here's how the line goes. When I understand my customer's problem better than they do, they immediately know that I'm the guy with the answer. So if you do kitchen cabinets, if you do framing, if you do pools, if you do renovations, and you're able to repeat back the problems and the fears and the frustrations that that person is feeling they're automatically going to know that you're the right person. So in order to understand that person, and I'm going to go on the residential side for this answer, commercial guys, hang on a sec. On the residential side, you have to know what neighborhood they live in and what neighborhood they don't. I'm sure you guys have heard the story about George before. George is a house painter, uh, but he was aiming at the wrong neighborhoods. And so he was aiming for neighborhoods with the kind of house he lived in, which is a smaller bungalow style home. And they just weren't very big paint jobs. And so guess what we did in coaching? We aimed at nicer neighborhoods. And it completely changed his business. He's well into the million dollar range now. When we started, I don't have my notes, but he was like, he's under 300 grand, probably under 200 grand when we first started, just by getting focused on the marketing and going after great neighborhoods to the point that where he used to sell a home painting job for two grand, he now goes to bigger homes where the subcontract price just for power washing the home and the pool deck is two grand. And he makes money on that from the sub. It's a completely different animal, but you have to understand who's your perfect customer, where they are, where they live, what their problems are, and how you solve it. That's number one. Number two is mindset. Number two is, gentlemen, what we call the four-inch problem. You, my friend, have a four-inch problem. And I know some of you are giggling and laughing, but it's a family show, so keep it clean, okay? What I mean is the space between your ears. It's about four inches, depending on who you are. It's about four inches. That's the problem. Mindset has been my problem. Is might be your problem, but if it whether it is or isn't, you've got to face up to it. <clears throat> and I want you to change the way you look at the world. I want you to change your philosophy and say this out loud to yourself. I'm a businessman or a businesswoman who just happens to run a contracting business. I'm a businessman who just happens to be a renovator. I'm a businessman who happens to build kitchen cabinets. I'm a businessman who happens to do hardscaping or site prep, whatever your trade is. It changes your mindset. It changes how you see the world, how problems get dealt with as, as they come across your desk, right? I'm a, I'm a business person who happens to be a fencing contractor. It's different. Now, as a business person, uh, Mr. Self has already recognized he has a marketing problem. And so now you got to say, I'm a business person who just happens to be a, I'm not going to say his trade, um, and now I'm a marketer. If you spend all your time marketing, you're going to have more clients than you ever imagined. Right now, for those of you dreaming, oh, I wish I had a full-time marketing person, but we're not very busy, so we can't afford it. Did you catch that? You get to be the marketing person right now. And I know it's tough. I know it's hard getting used to, but it's worth it. Remember what I said? Most of your competitors don't market at all. And so you can crush them very, very easily. So the next thing I want you to do is put a plan together on paper. Let's catch ourselves up. Number one is target is everything. Number two, mindset. I am a business person who just happens to be a contractor. Number three, put a plan together on paper. So how are you going to market to these perfect customers? Whatever it is. And by the way, and I'm going to make this point number four, the internet is not everything. You don't have to do Google pay-per-click. You don't have to be a Facebook ads expert. Let's just agree. You're never going to be. I'm never going to be an, a Facebook ads expert. I'm going to hire that. Somebody else can be better at that and I'll manage them. But the internet is not the only way to go get leads, regardless of what people say. It's kind of cowardly to go cringe behind a computer keyboard and go, I'm just going to get leads to come in online. I, want, I don't want to talk to any humans. Come on. You're proud of the work you do. You do great quality work. Get out there and tell the world and the world will come to find you. And so we can use traditional marketing methods, right? The traditional marketing methods, old-fashioned marketing still works. Old-fashioned marketing, like, uh, let's go, let's do the split right now. That was number five, by the way. Old-fashioned marketing still works. Let's catch us up. Number one, target is everything. 
Number two, mindset. I'm a business person who just happens to be a contractor. Number three, put a plan together on paper. Number four, the internet isn't everything. Number five, old-fashioned marketing still works. So now let's do our breakdown. Those of you who are in commercial contracting, commercial construction, welcome back. Uh, so let's let's start with the residential side first. Once you've identified the neighborhood, put up signage, lots of signage. Put out door flyers. Now, if all you can do is afford to print the door flyers, then you go knock on the doors or put the door hangers on yourself. That silence was intentional. You got to do it yourself. You've got to go get those jobs. Go talk to some people in the neighborhood. Make some friends, right? Postcards. Postcards work. That's why realtors send them all the time. When you see a, a realtor always hitting you with, with direct mail, hey, we just listed this house. Hey, we just sold this house. That's called farming an area. You don't know it, but you're the perfect client for that realtor because of where your home is. You can do the same thing for whatever your trade is, whether you do blinds, whether you do pools, whether you do kitchen cabinets, whether you do renovations, right? Um there is some use for a website called nextdoor.com. Uh, it's you know po popular in some cities, not so popular in others. It tends to be a smaller job size, so be very careful with that, right? I know that's an internet thing, but it's getting out there and understanding the community, listening to people, understanding their problems. That's where they're going to complain about their painter. That's where they're going to complain about the guy that just re, uh, refinished their driveway. That's where they're going to complain about the retaining wall. It's going to tell you how the people in your neighborhood talk about the tradespeople and show you how to be a step above, right? Um, talk to others who touch your trade. So go talk to other people who touch your trade. Here's what I mean. If you do plumbing, go talk to guys that do renovations. You're going to get some subcontract work. You're going to get some referral work. You're going to have to talk to lots of them to get it, but that's the job right now. Mr. South, you need work. Let's go find work, right? If you happen to do cabinets, then go talk, talk to other people that your clients will be talking to when they start to think about cabinets, like carpet stores, as an example. Go talk to your local carpet and tile stores. Go talk to the appliance place. And you know what you're going to hear from the sales manager or the owner of those shops? Well, people don't really come in here asking us about cabinets. Right. But when they do, I'd like you to refer them to me and just build a relationship with the owner or the manager of that store. And that's how these things start. Okay. Let's change gears and talk to the commercial guys for a second. Commercial, listen, it's really the same. You still have to start with Target. So Target, the best builders, the best GCs, the best developers, the best property managers. And here's one you maybe never thought of, the best franchises in your area. I'll get to that in a second. Franchises. What the heck is Rubino talking about? What's in his coffee? Franchises? Yeah. All right. So builders, builders, GCs, developers, franchisors, and property managers, I want you to go hit them on LinkedIn. Just make a LinkedIn connection with them. If you don't have a LinkedIn account, go get a LinkedIn account. That was it. Go get a LinkedIn account. Hit them on LinkedIn. Then I want you to send them a direct mail piece that says, hi, my name's Mr. South. I do this kind of trade and I'd be interested in doing work for you. Have you got anything? When can we talk? When can we go for lunch? So think about this as the LinkedIn and lunch program. You're going to go take these guys for coffee. You're going to go stop by. You're going to go knock on doors. You're going to go to homes that are under construction and go, or buildings that are under construction in this case, and talk to the person on site. You got to get out there. And here's the statement that my mom told me. I was a little kid. If you make a full-time job out of finding a job, you'll find a job. If you make a full-time job out of going to find more work, you'll find work. And so Mr. South, the business is out there waiting to be had. There's a lot of contractors who don't listen to shows like this who have no idea what they're doing, have their head up their shoe, and you're going to eat their lunch. All you got to do is get out there and market. All right, folks, thanks for checking in. Listen, if you like this stuff, if you want to learn how to grow your business, but customize to how your business is and who you are as a person, come find out more about coaching at 10xbuilt.com. So that's 10xblt.com. Read the website. If that interests you, apply. All it starts with is a simple conversation. Love to see you in the program. All of this stuff that we talked about here is laid out in a much more organized fashion because we take you through it in a, in a simple system for ourselves as well. Thanks for checking in, folks. I appreciate having you as a listener. We'll talk to you soon.